Bhagavad Gita, chapter 6, verse 19. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Gopi Jana Bhaurabha Girivara Dhari Jaya Gopi Jana Bhaurabha Girivara Dhari Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Gopi Jana Bhaurabha Girivara Dhari Jaya Gopi Jana Bhaurabha Girivara Dhari Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jayom Vishnu Pada Paramahansa Paribraja Kacharja Astutara Sata Shri Shri Madhai Sri Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Ananta Koti Vaishnava Vrinda Ki Jai Nama Charja Srila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai Prince Kaho Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadada Sri Vasari Gora Bhakta Vrinda Sri Sri Radha Krishna Gopa Gopinata Shama Kunda Radha Kunda Giri Govardhana Ki Jai Sri Vrindaban Mathura Dham Ki Jai Navadip Maya Purdham Ki Jai Jamuna Maya Ki Jai Ganga Maya Ki Jai Bhakti Devi Ki Jai Tulsi Devi Ki Jai Samaveta Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai All glories to the assembled devotees all glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. Bhagavad Gita, <coughs> chapter 6, verse 19. Yatadipo nivatashto menangate sapamasmrita yogino yatachittasya yunjato yogamatmanaha Yata dipo nivatashto nengate supamasmrita yogino yata chitasya yunjato yogamatmanaha yata dipo nivatashto nengate supamasmrita yogino yata chitasya yunjato yogamatmanaha Yata as Deepa a lamp Nivatishta in a place without wind Na does not Ingate waver Sa 
Upama, compared to that, Smrita, likened, Yoginaha, of the yogi, Yatrachitasya, whose mind is controlled, Yunjataha, constantly engaged in Yogam, meditation, Atmanaha, <coughs> on transcendence. Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada. As a lamp in a windless place does not waver, so the transcendentalist, whose mind is controlled, remains always steady in his meditation on the transcendent self. Purport. A truly Krishna conscious person, always absorbed in transcendence, in constant undisturbed meditation on his worshipable Lord is as steady as a lamp in a windless place. Yata di punivata sto nengate sopamasmrita yogino yatachittasya yunjato yogamatmanaha. The whole understanding of spiritual life begins and ends with understanding our relationship with God. We have many relationships, especially in the material world. Many, many. Bahuda Shaka Yanantascha, Ananta. Unlimited subject matters to which we are bound. Our family, our community, our nation, our education, our hobbies, our health, our wealth, so many things. But all these things or dependent upon the grace of Krishna. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains step by step the different processes. First, he introduces the Bhagavad Gita because he spoke the Gita to Arjuna, but it is meant as an introduction to spiritual life for us. Uh, there is a saying in, uh, in, in India that the mother-in-law teaches the daughter-in-law by teaching the daughter. What it means is that when a, a young girl marries, she goes to live in the house of her husband. And traditionally, not only in India, pretty much everywhere, before the technological revolution, people lived in joint families. I myself was brought up in a small village in Italy, and our immediate family were more than 30 members. So when a young girl marries, she goes to live with the family of the husband. But because she is new and there is no relationship built yet between her and the mother-in-law, so the mother-in-law has to teach her how the workings and the rules are in the new house. So she doesn't do it by teaching her directly. What the mother-in-law does, she teaches her own daughter, saying, my dear daughter, do like this and like that. And the new bride who is standing by, she's listening how a mother-in-law is teaching her daughter, and she is learning herself. Oh, this is what my mother-in-law likes. This is the system in this house. So in the same way, Krishna doesn't teach us directly. Frankly, <laughs> Teaching us directly is a sublime waste of time. You look around you, millions of people, zero interest in spiritual life. People sometimes say, oh, why the demigods don't come here? Why I cannot see Krishna? Why Krishna isn't present? The simple answer is because we don't want him here. We don't want him to be present. We don't respect demigods. We don't respect spiritual life. We respect might is right. We respect, enjoy the senses at all costs. And because of this mentality, we are closed to detachment. We are closed to transcendence. We are closed to understanding our relationship with God. And therefore God doesn't come because he's not wanted. I wouldn't go and meet with someone who doesn't want to see me, who insults me, who minimizes me. So why should God come and put himself in that position? 
he also has self-respect. Indeed, we have self-respect because God has self-respect. So he doesn't teach the demons directly because they don't want to hear. Krishna even says in the Gita later on, Bahunam Jammanam Ante. It takes many, 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 many births before one can understand who is Vasudev. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. Sa Mahatma. That person is a Mahatma. And he's so durlaba. Difficult, difficult to find. Millions of times more difficult to find than anything else. Therefore, when Krishna wants to speak to us, when Krishna wants to teach us who don't really want to learn, or even, okay, even if we want to learn, we don't really know, he teaches one of his own devotees. He teaches Arjuna, but Arjuna already knows. He's teaching Arjuna. Through him, he's teaching us. This is the process that is being used by Krishna. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna introduces the philosophy, the reality that we are not the body. Krishna puts Arjuna in illusion. Arjuna is not Arjuna is an eternal associate of Krishna. What does that mean? He's an expansion of Krishna. Wherever Krishna goes, Arjuna goes. In fact, uh, earlier on in the fourth chapter, uh, Krishna explained to Arjuna that I have instructed this science to the sun god. Imam vivasvate yogam Proktavam Mahamavyayam, this, this imperishable science. And it is imperishable because it deals with what is real. He says, I taught this science to Vivashwan. Vivashwan is the sun god. If you calculate the time span, Krishna was explaining the Bhagavad Gita to the sun god millions and millions of years ago. How do we know? Because Vivashwan taught his son, Manu. And Manu taught Ikshvaku, his son. So by understanding the lineage, we can understand how many millions of years ago Krishna taught the Bhagavad Gita to the sun god. And Arjuna was puzzled. He said, Aparam Bhavato Dharma. He says, your birth is recent. Uh, but the sun god was born millions of years ago. How am I to understand that you taught this science millions of years ago? So Krishna replied, Bahuni me vyati tani jammani chavat Arjuna. My dear Arjuna, you and I have had many, many, many births. Vediham sarva, tani sarvani anodemo natvam veta parantapa. My dear parantapa. Parantapa means one who performs great, great activities. Para means supreme. Tapa means who can give pain because Arjuna was a warrior. He was a supreme warrior. But even though he was a supreme warrior, he didn't remember his previous births. Not one veti. You did not know them. So Arjuna is being taught in the beginning. He's being put in illusion to mimic our situation. We are in real illusion. Arjuna was never in illusion. It was only an external manifestation. In fact, Arjuna was never, was never non-Krishna conscious. There is a very nice example in Mahabharata, also in the Bhagavatam, that after Krishna disappeared, Arjuna was escorting Krishna's queens from Dwarka to Astinapura for safety. And on the road, he was attacked by some coward men. Coward men, of course, they take care of the cows. But within the coward herd community, there is also some warriors that do learn the basics of, of warfare to protect their land, to protect their cows. And he was defeated by these coward men. And he was amazed. He was saying, what is this? This, he held up his bow, Gandiva. He said, this is the same bow. These are the same arrows with which I defeated so many warriors. In fact, he defeated Lord Shiva. There was a one-to-one -one 
battle between Arjuna and Shiva, and Shiva admitted defeat. So Arjuna was surprised, what has happened, that I am not able to defend Krishna's queens from these low-grade warriors from the coward community. And I am a prince, I am a Maharati, and I have the same weapons, but I am not able to use them. Then he said, and that's because Krishna has left. Krishna has left this planet, therefore my strength is gone. This is Arjuna's understanding. He never forgot that whatever power he had, that power came from Krishna. So, never there was a time when Krishna and Arjuna were separated. But to teach us, Arjuna was teaching the processes. So he begins the Bhagavad Gita by explaining the situation in the battlefield, explaining how Krishna didn't want to fight. The same battlefield is existing now. We are living in a battlefield. And the battlefield is between knowledge and ignorance. We are living in a battlefield because we don't want to, in which we do not accept Krishna's authority. But frankly speaking, everything we have, we did not create. We were born with nothing and we die with nothing. Dust thou art and dust you shall become. We are simply, our body is simply dust. Even our body we do not create. We don't know what is going to be our next birth. And when we are born, everything is provided for us. Our environment, our food, our shelter, all, we, all our requirements, they are provided by some other authority. We may not believe in God, but we cannot believe that it is our property. So there is, an ex just because I am born in a situation, it doesn't mean it belongs to me. I cannot take advantage and say, this is mine, this is my land, my house, my family. No, it belongs to somebody else. So in the Bhagavad Gita case, that somebody else is me. I am the owner, I am the proprietor. Aham sarvasya prabhavo, Krishna says. Everything is coming from me. Matta sarvam pravartate. Everything is my manifestation. Iti matva bhajante maam buddha bhava samam vitaha. If you're really intelligent, bhuva, Buddha Bhava, if you have intelligence, you understand that you are not a proprietor. Therefore, in the second chapter of the Gita, Krishna explains this very situation. That you have come here, you are passing through, but I am the owner. I am the proprietor of everything. Therefore, it is your duty to recognize. I cannot claim that I own this or that I created anything. But Krishna he is very bold. He very clearly says in the Bhagavad Gita, again and again and again, he explains that he is the proprietor, he is the owner, he is the benefactor, and he is our friend. All right? He is our friend because he goes with us wherever we go. Now, we may have friendship, but if there is some discrepancy, if there is some argument, about property or prestige, then the friendship breaks. The friendship between human beings continues as long as we satisfy each other's requirements for that friendship. That's not love, that's business. But real love is when even if there is every reason to break the relationship, nonetheless the relationship continues, that is a definition of love. Not my definition, this is in Chaitanya Charitamrita by Lord Chaitanya, where every situation exists to break a relationship, yet the relationship continues, that is a sign of love. And that is reflected in our attitude towards Krishna. We don't give him the time of the day, we don't recognize him, yet he goes with us, birth after birth after birth. Whether we approve or whether we disapprove, whether we welcome him or whether we don't. And this is real love. He doesn't let go. A friend doesn't let go of his friend because of external circumstances. But that friendship cannot be found in the material world. That friendship is in the spiritual world. So, in the second chapter, Krishna explains this process of our relationship with God. And he explains the process of yoga. What is this yoga? Yoga means to connect. 
Uh, basically, when we speak of yoga, we mostly think of the yoga taught by the Rishi Patanjali. Uh, there are six, six branches of philosophy explained in the Vedas, and one branch is the yoga of Patanjali. That yoga means, was actually practiced millions of years ago. It is meant for those rare souls who, can, who have the capacity and the willingness to control the senses. Yoga you cannot practice in a community. You cannot practice yoga with the opposite sex around. Yoga means you practice alone, away from community, in the forest, in a, in a, in a sacred place. And the first principle of yoga is yam, to control the senses. Because if you don't control the senses, you cannot understand your spirit soul. It is an ongoing practice. So, yam, yama, that is the first, yama means to curb, therefore we have the demigod, yamaraj, who curbs the living entities, the sinful living entities at death. So, yam, niyam, niyam means to follow certain rules. There are certain rules of eating, sleeping, of course, there is no question of mating if you practice yoga. So, yam, niyam, and asan. You sit. Asan means a sitting posture. Sitting in a, in a holy place. And you practice pranayam, the breathing process, to control the airs within the heart, to make you peaceful, and to make you prepared for the process of dharan, or the process of 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 maintaining that position of detachment. Not that you just practice yoga on the weekends and then you know, after the weekend you go back and do all sorts of nonsense and the next week you practice yoga again. Not like that. Dharan. So. And then Pratigraha. When you practice in maintaining your spiritual position, you can withdraw your senses from the objects of the senses. That is called Pratigraha. Then comes real meditation, Dhyan. And through this dhyan meditation, you achieve samadhi, which means you meet the Lord within your heart. That kind of yoga, it is impossible to practice in these times. There may be some very, very few extra yogis, maybe in the Himalayas or somewhere, but actually it is not practical for anyone. And the other disadvantage of this Ashtanga yoga is that you become very powerful, but mostly yogis, they practice, and there are eight yoga cities, anima, lagima, prapti, well, we won't go into it, but basically speaking, you can become as light as a feather, you can become as heavy as a mountain. For example, Dhruva Maharaj, there is, a, there is a, an explanation in the Bhagavatam that when he practiced yoga, many millions of years ago, he was standing on one foot and he became so heavy that the whole universal system of universal affairs became disturbed. So that is called Mahima, to become heavy, heavier than the heaviest. Uh, anima, smaller than the smallest. Uh, just recently there was a, Krishna has this quality of Anima. Uh, one of my god brothers was speaking at a meeting a few weeks ago and he mentioned that he asked the question do you know how many uh, atoms are within a material body an average material body nobody knew so he quoted a figure something like three billion or thirty billion three billion atoms three billion atoms in your physical body three billion Everybody was amazed. So afterwards I was sitting next to him and I said, you know, it is amazing that in a human body there is 30 billion atoms. But what is more amazing is that Krishna is sitting in each and every one of them. This is God's power. There is 30 billion Krishnas in everyone's body. Think about that. So that is called anima that practice. Then there is prapti. Prapti means you can get things from far away and bring them. Isita, Vasita, you can control others. You can create a planet. There is a story of uh, Vishwamitra who had a disciple, Trishanku, 
And this disciple said, I want to go to the heavenly planets in this body. Normally, you cannot travel to other planets in this body. There is how you can travel to other planets like the moon or the sun or Dhruva Loka is that at the moment of death, you meditate on that place. And if you practice the proper systems of yoga, you can transfer yourself to another planet. But Trishanku said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to go to the heavenly planets in my own body. So Vishambhita said, fair enough, go. So Trishanku began to ascend towards the heavenly planets. And the demigods, they said, no, you cannot come into the heavenly planets because you are not qualified. So there was a tussle between Vishwamitra and the demigods. So Vishwamitra said, very well, you don't want to allow my disciple to come into your heavenly planets. I will create a duplicate heavenly planet system and he will stay there. And immediately he began to create different planets. So this is called Isita. This is one of the yogi pra yoga practices. Then, of course, Krishna explains his different kinds of yoga. But he said, but at the end of this chapter, Krishna really reassumes what is the purpose of yoga and what is the best yoga to practice in this age. And he says, Yogina api sarvesham mat gatena antaratmanaha. Out of all the yogis, one who is situated in meditation in me, in my consciousness. That is the base of yogi. Shraddhaman bhajate yoman same yukta mataha. One who worships me in, med in yoga, in connection. Yoga means to connect. Maya shakta mana partha, Krishna explains in the seventh chapter that become attached to me, our yoga yunjam, by the connection of yoga. Then, if you do that, asamsayam samagramam yata gnasyasi tat srinu. Simply srinu, listen. I will explain to you how you can connect with me in the, through the process of yoga to unite with me or to connect with me. Then you become free from doubt. Asamshayam, and you become completely knowledge, samagram. So this is the process of the Bhagavad Gita. There is no excuse in being in spiritual ignorance. Krishna has explained very clearly in Bhagavad Gita, verse after verse, chapter after chapter. Not only has Krishna explained, Krishna's devotees have explained, the great sages, we simply need to want to accept this knowledge. But because we are stubborn, because we are closed to surrender into Krishna, because we are too absorbed in satisfying our senses, this sense gratification, this absorption, means we remain on a mental platform, on a simply like sophisticated animals. So this is not the process. So Bhagavad Gita is there. Uh, it's not, it's very easily, the Sanskrit in Bhagavad Gita is very, very simple. Whereas the Sanskrit in the Vedanta, in the Puranas, in the Vedas is very much more complicated. Bhagavad Gita is very simple verses in four lines. Krishna explains very simply, but very powerfully, as only he can. So this is my advice. Take advantage of the Bhagavad Gita. Thank you for participating. And we'll see you again on Friday. So we have some comments from Atma Vidya Prabhu, humble obeisances, from Mandi Prior in England, Hare Krishna. Very nice to have you back, dear Prabhu. Yes, I'm very happy to be back. I was ill for a while, but uh, my health is back now, and I'm going to keep up my, my Gita classes, which I enjoy. And I couldn't do it without you, so thank you for participating. And uh, Vrishni Vamsa is also there. All glories to the assembled devotees. And he says, of all yogas, Bhakti Yoga is the best and the simplest in meditation. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and a bona fide guru. Thank you very much. Yes, Bhakti Yoga, actually, Bhakti Yoga is not easy. What is, it's become easy by the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's uh, the chanting of the Krishna mantra, it's an amnesty given by Krishna. Anyone who chants can become free from illusion and reawaken his eternal relationship 
which is already there. Nitya Siddha Krishna Bhakti. It is already there. Shadya Kabuna. You don't get it from anywhere else. It becomes awakened in your heart when you turn your face towards Krishna. Thank you very much. Haribo.